Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Cardona, Deputy Director at Greenbelt Alliance, and I'm so excited to see all of you here today to discuss a new view of Greenbelts in wildfire protection and preparedness. So today, we launch Greenbelt Alliance's original research entitled The Critical Role of Greenbelts in Wildfire Resilience as our evidence-based recommendations for urgent solutions to our wildfire crisis. Many people made this work possible, and I'd like to take a moment to just thank the Greenbelt Alliance team who worked so hard on this project, especially lead author Terry Shore, as well as the many individuals we interviewed who informed this research. We are also grateful to our donor community, including the Arnst Family Foundation, the Lisa and Douglas Goldman Fund, Steve Silverstein, and the Laney and Pasha Thornton Foundation, as well as the hundreds of donors from around the Bay Area whose contributions further our work every day. Thank you so much. If this is your first time joining us, Greenbelt Alliance is a regional environmental advocacy nonprofit working to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. And we're certainly feeling the effects of that changing climate. I'm sure we can all picture where we were that surreal day last September, when our skies were an eerie orange as the air quality was so poor from intense wildfire smoke that the sun was literally blocked from view. The Bay Area and much of the Western United States is at a tipping point with wildfires becoming larger, more frequent, and more damaging. We're all anxious for what's around the corner this season and really wondering you know, what are the changes that we urgently need to make because the status quo isn't working. Well, Greenbelt Alliance set out to connect the dots on how to safely coexist with wildfire, which is what we present here to you today. We have compiled the evidence to make the case to elected officials, government staff, and planners that we have a huge opportunity to prioritize green belts, our open spaces and agricultural lands to build our resilience to wildfire. With just a few slides, I'll introduce our findings and policy recommendations, and then I'll turn to a discussion with our panel of experts joining me here today to dig into the details. We started by identifying four types of green belts that play a role in reducing the loss of life and home in extreme wildfire events while increasing overall resilience in communities and across landscapes. These greenbelt types are, number one, open spaces, parks, and preserves adjacent to and surrounding high wildfire risk communities. Greenbelt type number two are the agricultural and working lands, such as vineyards, orchards, and farms. Greenbelt type number three are greenbelt zones that are strategically planned and placed inside subdivisions and communities, not surrounding them. And finally, greenbelt type number four are recreational greenways, such as bike paths, playing fields, and golf courses. For all of these types, we are not referring to wildlands or forest type landscapes. And in our research, we found a range of benefits that these four different types of greenbelts provide in terms of wildfire. So I'm going to briefly go through our top six findings. First, green belts serve as strategic locations for wildfire defense. Existing parks, open spaces, and preserves near communities are often used for firefighting and as staging areas for the firefighters. Second, green belts act as natural buffers, creating that distance and separation from communities and wildfires approaching. For example, farm and ranch lands, such as vineyards, orchards, food crops, and other cultivated plants, they tend to be resistant to wildfire due to their relatively high water content. And so as a result, agricultural lands help slow or even stop wildfire in some cases that we found. Third, this work showed us that it isn't enough to simply establish green belts, that it's really critical that they be well maintained. So if properly managed and stewarded, we found that green belts can reduce the size and number of extreme wildfires that threaten communities. 
Fourth, agricultural lands that use best management practices for regenerative agriculture can serve an important role in increasing overall wildfire resilience. Our fifth finding is that protecting lands in high wildfire risk areas can deliver both wildfire risk reduction benefits and biodiversity benefits, as many of those places can also be species rich areas. And finally, strategically plan and placed greenbelt zones inside neighborhoods with wild fire resistant landscaping around clustered homes really provide risk reduction benefits. Now, Greenbelt Alliance has been around for over 60 years and is known for establishing and protecting Greenbelts. After all, Greenbelt is in our name. And you know, we know that many of these beloved open spaces that have been protected across the region over the years were actually created for other reasons, not initially necessarily for reducing wildfire risk. And we were so inspired in this work by how these lands have also added benefits for protecting us from wildfire. So in our white paper, we highlight eight case studies showing this connection for the first time of these existing green belts providing wildfire benefits. So definitely check out the white paper to learn more. So given all of this, we believe that there is huge potential for the Bay Area and other fire prone communities to accelerate using green belts to better plan and prepare for wildfire and to protect entire communities from wildfire risk. We have four top recommendations for policymakers, planners, and advocates here with us today. You know, we actually see this event as the beginning of our collaboration with all of you so that we can work together to get these things done and leverage nature-based solutions like green belts to build our resilience to wildfire. So here's a snapshot of our top recommendations. So first, cities and counties must more intentionally prioritize green belts in their wildfire planning and establish new green belts for the purposes of responding to wildfire threats. Cities and counties should also adopt or renew local policies like urban growth boundaries to contain growth inside urban areas. This follows the fire science research that city-centered growth is the most wildfire safe. We also recommend that the state of California achieve its ambitious goal of protecting 30% of California's lands by 2030 by prioritizing green belts in high fire risk areas to foster both wildfire resilience in communities while also protecting the state's biodiversity. Our second recommendation is to enhance stewarding lands to restore beneficial wildfire regimes. Land managers, like many of you here today, should take a balanced approach to this, including prescribed burning, selective harvest, non-commercial thinning, and traditional forest treatment as practiced by tribes. Our third recommendation is for local planning departments in consultation with housing advocates and developers to create zoning overlays that require greenbelt zones, especially in high fire risk areas. As the Bay Area is continuing to grow, you know, how we choose to design our communities really matters for our current and future residents facing the growing threats of wildfire year after year. And finally, we introduce a new concept of a community wildfire resilience zone bordering towns and cities in high fire risk areas that we recommend the Bay Area implement for heightened resilience and wildfire protection benefits. These zones could provide more permanent and consistent risk reduction and focus wildfire resources while potentially unlocking new funding mechanisms for permanent protection and vegetation management. So to put this research into action, we all must advocate for innovative land use policies like recognizing green belts as wildfire risk reduction strategies. We must drive change at the state, regional, and local levels, working together to shift our relationship to wildfire. Again, today we see this as the beginning of that collaboration across sectors with multiple stakeholders like all of you here. 
So let's all take a new view of green belts in order to influence the change that we need in the short and long term. Given what we saw from the 2020 wildfire season, it's more critical than ever that we act on bold new approaches right now. So we are sharing this research with you today in hopes that you learn more and engage with us in our next step advocacy agenda. Join our network to get more information on how to support getting these recommendations done. And again, we hope that you check out our paper for the full story on why green belts play such a critical role in wildfire resilience and get in touch with us on ways that you see that we can all partner on this work ahead. So now I'd like to turn to our panelists to get their take on these issues. They each are leaders in their fields, tackling our wildfire challenges and bringing their stories and experiences that reflect just how critical green belts are. You know, with this research being widely applicable beyond the Bay Area, I'm delighted that we have experts from the region as well as Washington and Oregon joining me here today. They include Melanie Parker, Deputy Director of Sonoma County Regional Parks, Dr. Michael Medler, Professor and Chair of Environmental Studies at Western Washington University, Missy Arias, General Manager of the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, and Timothy Inglesby, former firefighter and Executive Director of Firefighters United for Safety, Ethics, and Ecology. So with that, we will dive right in to our conversation. And I want to thank each of you for being here with us today. So <laughs> nice to see you all. So Misty, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with you. Uh, you know, as we've seen and we've been uh, showcasing here, existing green belts are, are not always traditionally associated you know, with wildfire benefits that they provide. And the goal of our research here was to show a different perspective about the benefits of varying greenbelt types so that we can get more protected and stewarded you know, on the ground. And so we'd love to hear from you, Misty, you know, what policy tools are you implementing at the Sonoma County Ag and Open Space District to successfully protect you know, fire prone lands outside of urban areas? And you know, how have these protected natural and working lands benefited people in recent wildfires? Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this. I think it's, um, as you've heard from me already, Sarah, I, it's, it's wonderful to see, at least in our community, we have adopted urban growth boundaries. So the green belts haven't been getting quite as much attention lately, because I think people have stopped worrying about the lands right outside of these urbanized areas. And our organization um, was created in the early 90s um, with public funding to protect open space in some agricultural lands and open space in Sonoma County. And initially that was the primary purpose was to focus on these areas right outside of um, our incorporated communities. So, and I was, uh, you know, there in the early days. So I'm excited to be able to reflect upon those same geographic regions, but for very, maybe multiple layered benefits. You know, we had been looking at them differently historically, like the benefits of health to our communities by growing food locally and by providing uh, wilderness or recreational experiences, all the things that you've highlighted. But we've um, really started to see these areas differently. So um, our organization has just recently adopted a new uh, strategy for prioritizing lands for protection in the county called the Vital Lands Initiative. And we're using typical data that we would use as a land conservation organization. Where is biodiversity? Where are good ag soils? But now we are also looking at fire patterns and what we've seen in our county historically, where are these areas of high fire risk? We have so much science around this. And then we are prioritizing our efforts on the urban edge uh, in this exact context that you're describing. So we're prioritizing lands in these urban in these wildland urban interface, these greenbelt lands for um, providing for recreation opportunities, growing food and doing these types of land management approaches that also help slow fire and give us the opportunity to, to fight fire, you know, outside of areas where there's going to be much more damage and, um, you know, loss of, of property and human life. So I have a, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. We had 
immediately when there's something this urgent that faces your community, everybody looks to everybody and says like, what are the things you can do? And um, because we do have public funding, it, initially I think there was, we were a little bit at a loss, like what is it, what can we do? But I'm so excited that one of the opportunities for all of us is to focus on land conservation and the multiple benefits of it. And then also look at enhanced management practices to help slow fire and manage these lands in a way that can help make our community safer. So I really appreciate uh, that you guys have done this work. It's going to be hugely beneficial for our organization to be able to use and help set priorities moving forward. Um, and I thought I could share um, one story. I don't know how long you want me to, one story that we chatted about that in, in our experience is the perfect example of what, what could be different if we didn't have urban, urban growth boundaries and protected lands outside of our urban communities. In the glass fire last year, we, we have a property that we own outright that is um, right, right up against the um, city limits of the city of Santa Rosa to the northeast. And um, the glass fire burned all the way up to the urban edge, actually into some of the residential neighborhoods. But where our preserve is, there had been approved a 29 lot subdivision and that property would have been developed. There would have been additional 29 houses. The, the property burned very hot and intensively. Uh, the natural conditions on the land are already showing regeneration, but we did not have the same type of loss in property and risk to human life because we hadn't built in that region also. Uh, Cal Fire was able to use the property to set up a line of defense because there is a very urbanized and highly um, a much denser urban community right adjacent to the property. And so it, it showed this, um, this work and the recommendations that you're making in one, one very powerful example for our organizations. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And it's those like visceral examples that we you know, been, been able to, to, to look back and, and see and point to that's really illuminating, um, you know, what we, what we think we need to be doing more of into the future. And um, that glass fire example um, is something that we also highlight in one of the case studies. There's a clear role of the nearby open space and park areas that performed these wildfire risk reduction benefits during, during that fire, even just last year. So it's definitely something we want folks to, to take a, a closer look at. And, you know, you, you mentioned then that there's clearly this, this leadership from, from you and other partners um, across the years to really get these uh, protections in place. And, you know, Grima Alliance also has, has uh, had a hand in that with core partners like you all, uh, the Open Space District and others to really get, for Sonoma County in particular, um, establishing those community separators, you know, the Greenbelt lands that are in between the county cities and towns. And it's so interesting to see now that we're really seeing the payoffs of safeguarding those unincorporated lands from development when it comes to wildfire and the lessons really that we can be drawing from that of the city, city centered growth yeah. um, is, is really the, the most wildfire safe in, in these cases. Um, so but you also hit on something that I want to then um, turn turn to Melanie to talk more about, which is again, it's it's, it's establishing, but really that that maintenance and stewardship of these landscapes is so critical. And it was really one of the best practices that our research highlighted that really makes a difference here, um, and, and was illuminating to us. You know, it's the establishment, but also the maintenance and the stewardship of these lands to return you know beneficial wildfire regimes. And in the past, our organization focused on policies to primarily you know, prevent development, but really didn't necessarily weigh in on the management and the stewardship. And, and now we're, we're seeing that this is just such a critical step in order to leverage these existing you know, natural resources to reduce wildfire risk. So, you know, Melania, I'm excited to hear details from you because the Sonoma County Regional Parks is actively managing landscapes in a variety of ways. And, um, you know, we were, we were talking about how you guys are also a part of the Sonoma Valley Wildlands Collaborative, this really fascinating public-private partnership to coordinate the management of, I think it's 18,000 acres um, across boundaries and across property lines, you know, to really reduce those future impacts of wildfire to communities. So would love for you to share more about that and really the nuances that are at play here for open space to be a solution to wildfires and, and not a wildfire threat and, and what you're just seeing is what's working on the ground taking a regional approach to the stewardship. 
Yeah, great. And I'm monitoring the chat too. So I completely think this is great that you're putting a focus in this white paper on stewardship. I think it's something that the, uh, we in the environmental community um, are a little bit guilty of. We spent a lot of time focusing on pre uh, preventing land from being converted to development. But we lost track of the fact that land, especially in the Bay Area, in the Mediterranean climate here, but really across the American West, land gets converted if you re if you remove the disturb the natural disturbance elements. And so when you remove herbivory, you know, with great herds of animals, and you remove cultural fire and wildfire. Um, you very quickly see what we see in many of our uh, parks and open spaces across California, which is they convert. And so they, you know, a beautiful oak woodland like is behind me, which is, by the way, been well tended, um, converts to a Douglas fir forest and is much, much more of a conflagration. It also loses its biodiversity. Um, you know, a, a grassland that was uh, very biodiverse with a lot of different grass and forb species converts to Italian oak grass or worse, Italian thistle and is nothing but a fire trap. Uh, and so, you know, by stewarding, by following, you know, I'm sort of, on, Missy's heard me before, I'm on this mantra, always follow acquisition with stewardship dollars because um, just to acquire it is not enough. You actually have to steward the land and, you know, the, the, um, the park that you profiled in your report, Foothill Regional Park, it was just really a dramatic example of where an, an oak woodland really on the verge of oak savanna that was well tended by the previous landowners, uh, as well as, you know, with regional parks um, uh, stewardship, uh, was able to allow Cal Fire an opportunity to really send partners to save uh, and the entire town of Windsor. It was a wind driven fire event, which you could say, well, nothing's going to stop an ember driven, you know, river, a river of embers, but as it, you know, the way fires burn, they ebb and flow throughout the day. And it was, it was very possible for them to back burn through that, that park and protect the town of Windsor. And I was just in Foothill this morning and the oak canopy is coming back and, you know, native plants are coming back and it's a mosaic of, of disturbance and it's absolutely beautiful. So, um, so I'm really happy that you're emphasizing stewardship, but I did want to add one other thing that came to mind listening to Misty, and that is something that really got amplified for us at regional parks during COVID. Um, we've always known that it's important for people to have parks close to where they live and from a climate lens, we want people to be able to walk and bike to places where they can uh, access health, right, and, and the health benefits of being in the outdoors. But it, it occurs to me that this resilience buffer concept is also going to be really good from a human health perspective of creating more opportunities for biking, walking, enjoying nature in places that are equitably distributed and accessible um, without getting in a car. So I'm really happy from that standpoint, too, as a parks advocate. Melody, that's excellent. You're, you're reading our minds as well. I mean, why we were thinking to call them resilient zones because it's it's that fire protection, but but so much more uh, we could really unlock in, in those particular areas. So you're talking about equitable access, that public health benefits of being outdoors, in addition to you know, creating that natural buffer um, to potential wildfires that may be encroaching on communities. That's, that's great. Um, and I definitely want to... Um, hear a little bit more about that um, collaborative if there's additional things that you know we have a, we have a little bit of time and, and I definitely do want to monitor the chat here for some questions as well but um, was there is there something you know particularly um, working with that regional approach to stewardship that you'd like to see you know other regions um, potentially taking on um, as part of making all of this work? Always and everywhere. I mean, I think uh, the larger the landscape that you can cooperate on, the better. You know, wildlife work on a much larger uh, landscape than parcel level, obviously ecological processes. Um, so when we started with this collaborative, it was a little bit more focused on wildlife connectivity and it very quickly morphed into multi-benefit conversation about, about, so we're, you know, working on fuels and uh, reducing fuels with prescribed fire as well as active fuels management, but also promoting wildlife 
connectivity and also restoring watersheds. So, you know, you can just do a lot more and you can also sometimes leverage and access larger funding uh, opportunities when you work together and you can say to a funder, look, we're gonna treat 18,000 acres, not 1800 acres or 18 acres, right? So I completely am a, a, a devotee of uh, landscape level cooperation on these sorts of projects. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing about that. Those definite benefits to taking that approach. And, you know, I think it's, it is that sort of regional coordination across political boundaries that Greenbelt Alliance is also really excited to be driving those kinds of efforts here across the region. And our team is, is fostering then, you know, what are the kinds of policies and the practices like you were uh, identifying for the actors to really pitch in together and, and, and take on. And so um, just a, a quick note to, to all of you to, to look for later this year, um, Greenbelt Alliance is actually coming out with our resilience playbook, we're calling it, that compiles a, a bunch of recommendations on of innovative land use policies and practices for climate hazards, including wildfire, flooding, and more. So definitely want to um, check that out as an additional piece of, of information from our team. Um, you also mentioned something really important in the conversation, which is prescribed fire. And I actually want to invite Tim into this conversation with us as well. Um, you know, prescribed fire and, and our, we're on the theme of really stewarding these landscapes. And, you know, Tim, you're up in, in Oregon and would love to hear more from you. Of like, what are you seeing uh, there and beyond? And, and, and uh, just talk to us more about the ways that prescribed fire is being used to really man manage and maintain green belts. Well, it's a thrill to be part of this, and I'm very excited about the release of the paper, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, I am speaking from Eugene, Oregon, which is in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, the, uh, the traditional lands of the Kalapuya tribe. And they lived in this area for 10,000 years. In the area where the wildfires are rare, they do occur. In fact, lightning was predicted in this area today. Uh, how do they do it? The Kalapuya didn't own a single fire engine, a single air tanker or dozer or any of that stuff. How did they live in a fire prone environment? Well, because they didn't attempt to fight against fire, they worked with fire and they carefully and selectively and strategically burned around their village sites, created green belts, if you would, well, with fire. Uh, they also burned uh, you know, various uh, you know, places for uh, to help harvest and harvest food or hunt game, and so they really stewarded the land with fire, and that way they they not only survived but they thrived in a fire environment. Five hundred human generations, they became very adept at working with fire and using it for all the the multiple benefits it provides. So. Uh, you know, we, we got a little bit of a head start on the west side of, of Eugene uh, on lands that are owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. They use prescribed fire to maintain one of the last remnants of the native prairie habitat that is almost all gone in, in the valley. It's been converted to cities or farms or whatever. And uh, so, uh, you know, they work with fire to maintain that habitat and all that biodiversity. It's kind of a spectator event when they burn and uh, right up to the edge of homes, but they burn in the right, right conditions to do that. And then, uh, you know, what comes up when, 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 the, when the land greens up is just gorgeous. Uh, it's a great place for birding, uh, hunting butterflies, seeing all the critters and all the flowers that, that emerge uh, that are, are kind of uh, nurtured by fire. So, uh, you know, we don't need to really invent something brand new. We can kind of relearn how to live with and work with fire. And especially this concept of stewarding the land, creating green belts around where we live, you know, with, with fire, other tools available, uh, it makes perfect sense. Tim, thank you. Yeah, we, we know what to do here. And uh, it's, it's a matter of getting it done. And, you know, we've been talking here about uh, why this is so important to prepare and protect communities from another extreme and damaging wildfire season by really accelerating you know, where we can establish, protect, and, you know, apply these practices to manage um, green belts as nature-based solutions to build resilience. And, 
um, in, in our prep call, uh, Michael, I'm getting ready for you, um, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, how really all of this will entail reestablishing a natural fire regime to the landscape. So, right, you were talking about that we know that we need to, to push for the prescribed burns, for example. And it, it really, in order to do that, you know, we need communities to feel resilient and, and able to withstand and, and be safe from um, wildland fires and, and be comfortable with that. And uh, one thing that we were talking about that could really go a long way in that would be establishing well-managed greenbelt buffers around cities and towns, helping people you know, feel safe, particularly uh, the communities that are in rural environments on the edge of of public forest lands. And, you know, Dr. Medler, you are researching what this would look like, and you've actually inspired, you know, one of um, Green Belt Alliance's recommendations of uh, the Bay Area implementing a community wildfire resilience zone um, based on uh, what we're learning from you. And so can you share more about your research and why you see this recommendation for community wildfire resilience zones as a promising approach for the Bay Area to investigate further? Okay, well, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right, well, thank you. It's great to be here. And uh, I consider my job here to be to talk about scale mostly and sizes. And excuse me, I'm used to having lots of big pictures and PowerPoints and maps and graphs. So um, I try not to say too many numbers. I lose track of billions, millions, trillions pretty quick myself. But the, the real take home story I wanted to sort of focus on today um, has already been led up to really well. Melanie and Tim have been talking about things that uh, tie into what we've all heard now for years, the story of the fuel buildups across North America and in Canada and other places. We fought fires, lots of stuff has come in. I see people in the comment section already talking about that. And it's a problem of, of a scale that we can't actually really get our heads around. Um, I think in about 2012, the head of the Forest Service testified um, at a Senate committee that there were about a half billion, that's 500 million acres in the United States that needed some sort of treatment. Um, well, that's a number, 500 million. Well, what's that? That's the size of the state of Alaska. And once again, that's, we're not going to fix that. We're not going to get with chainsaws and fix 500 million acres. It would, it would take millions of people, you know, and we're not going to do that. So we have to think about how we're going to target these efforts. Another way to think about it is uh, there's been different maps produced, but by various estimates, our wildland urban interface, the area where, where we live as people is interfacing interfacing, intermixing with wildlands is an area about the size of Texas. So still, you know, unimaginable amounts of land to try to do something about. Um, but to dig in for California, I think in 2018, there was a California forest carbon plan. It's one of a lot of different documents, but it came up with a number that seems to be about in line with a lot of others, which is 20 million acres of California are in trouble. They need treatment, they need thinning, they need forest fires, they need something to get back out of, into whack, if you like. They're out of whack now. And once again, for a sense of scale, uh, I live in the state of Washington and it's only about twice that big. We're 44 million acres versus 20. So we're talking thinning, treating, having some sort of prescribed fire in a place half the size of the entire state of Washington for California to get back out of, out of whack. So um, even Oregon and Washington, last numbers I saw were um, like 11 million acres in need of treatment just in the states of Oregon and Washington. Now, a um, long time ago, uh, I've cleared acres, I've thinned, I've worked for the Forest Service, I've worked in groups of 10 on reasonably flat land, uh, 10 of us working pretty hard for three or four days were able to effectively thin and pi make piles on about an acre. So well, let's see. Quick math says we need millions of people working all the time if we're going to do this. And we weren't even on steep terrain and we never even got around to burning the piles, but it took 10 of us days to clear an acre. So you can do all the math you want with what, what's it going to take to clear 20 million acres. I've also been on fires where tens of thousands of acres burned in an afternoon, accomplishing the same goals. And this is the tricky part. Wildland fire will do the work that fire has done. We've got all sorts of subtleties and problems. The fires may be too hot now. And you know, there's a lot of detail here. But if we're going to get 20 million acres in California, 100, 000, 100 million acres in the United States back into whack, it's only going to be by using fire. But as we've seen in all of these states in the last couple of summers, that's a hard sell when you're burning up 
forest right up to the edge of Eugene and Portland, Oregon, and people in California are more than aware of what this means to have fires burning near their communities. So what I wanted to chat about here is that Jack Cohen and a bunch of other folks in the Forest Service have been doing research for years. And a lot of that research indicates that a lot of, not all, but a lot of what you need to do to stop forest fires, wildland fires, grass fires from coming into communities can be done with about a quarter acre buffer. And this ties into our the discussions here of the, 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 the different types of things communities might do with their different types of resilient and green zones around them. But this isn't a huge area, a quarter mile, that's you know 400 meters if we wanna speak metric. And this isn't a, an area that you clear cut or do a complete scrape to the mineral earth. It just needs to have room for fire trucks to get through, to lay hoses for people to work. And it needs to have the canopy broken up. So we're still talking parkland by and large. You know, If you hear Jack Cohen talk about it, he's talking about areas that in California, you would think, oh, that's a lovely park here in this town. We can play Frisbee, we can run through it. You know. um, and so that's what he and a lot of the Forest Service work indicates is what we need to stop most fires from getting into communities. Now there's a million caveats involving windblown embers and roofs and all the other stuff you have to do to stop fires from leaping from place to place. And those are, those are non-trivial issues. But as far as treating the ground, we have this opportunity to focus our efforts. And here's what I, I have been arguing is those areas are much smaller. And if we target them first and communities feel more resilient, then maybe we can start using wildland fire at the scale we're going to have to on those millions and millions of acres in the backcountry. Now here, just to give you some a couple sort of numbers to float around in your head, I took um, all of the places in the United States that have a name. So these aren't cities and even towns. This is little, little places that have a, a church and a couple gas stations, maybe at an intersection. The census has put out this lovely map data set of every place that has a name in the United States. And I've had a bunch of work with students and we've just checked, well, let's make quarter mile, 400 meter buffers around all of those places. So in California, for example, we took all of those little communities in the area, like in North of San Francisco where that you're talking about. And there's lots of little pockets and communities. And we checked how many acres were in the buffers around those. And then we laid that over the map of the wildland urban interface. Now here's where it gets interesting. So let me just recap a couple big numbers. State of California is about 100 million acres, 100 million acres. 20 million acres, about a fifth of the state needs some kind of treatment. At least 2 million acres are in WUI. And actually quite a bit more if you include the intermix and we won't get lost in that. But here's the thing, when we overlapped and looked at how much of these buffers around every place in the state, the whole state of California overlapped areas that needed to be treated because they're in the WUI, that was only about 100,000, 110,000 acres. Now these are, you know, 110, 2 million, what's all the difference? To back up, if there's 20 million acres that need help and only 100,000 that are in the buffer zones, that's a 200th, 1 200th the total acreage. So we can treat effectively 1 200th of the total problem and create buffers in everywhere and every community in California that has wildland urban interface coming in against their community. Now, this isn't the solution to all the problems, but it's a heck of a starting spot if you wanna to try to target resources for thinning and road building and trying to get all this work done. And there's always this counter effort to try to treat these huge areas in the back country. And once again, I think one of the problems is people live largely near where people live and they fail to realize how big the rest of it is. And we're not gonna go out and fix 20 million acres in California in, in, in our lifetimes. But this year we could do 100,000 acres of work around communities with the right budget. That's, that's a year or two. So that's, that's my main take home uh, message here. And that other flip side above that, about that is it provides opportunities for people to work near where we live. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take a lot of people. It's gonna provide employment possibilities and let people live near where they are. I'm, I've talked to a lot of people who are excited about this as a way to keep young people in rural communities to give them jobs near their homes. And when come fire season, you have locals who know the area super well. They've done the thinning, they know where things are. As a final note, I would honestly argue that kind of resilience for communities is the only way we'll really have a conversation about having fire do its work in the other tens of millions of acres we're talking about. So I hope I didn't do too many numbers, but very big, very little. That's the take home. 
That's right. That, that was certainly, you, you hit the nail on the head for scale. That was your, your main goal here today. So really help us zoom in on the scale that's really the most effective and efficient way to start really tackling this issue. And, you know, that's why we were just so inspired by taking a further look at this concept for the Bay Area. We see this really being something provocative for us all to be digging into the next level details. Okay, how could we actually implement this here in the Bay Area? Partnering with all of you here um, on the call with us today to make that possible. You know, we're calling them community wildfire resilience zones again, because you and, and Melanie both were highlighting it. So it's wildfire risk reduction, job creation, public health, um, you know, equitable access to open space, you know, benefits that we could reap from, from these areas in addition to just targeting, you know, our, our resources and our attention. Um, you know, it might not work everywhere. I think I'm, I'm seeing in, in the chat box, you know, there, there could be like, how, how might this work? You know, in examples of really urban context with city bordering cities. So that may not exactly be um, where we might see this. We, we need to do the next level analysis. But what's really kind of exciting is that you know, this kind of land use policy could both really, as you were helping describe, like provide that more permanent and consistent wildfire risk reduction at the scale that we really need it. Um, for protecting communities uh, and to really be able to focus our attention and focus our resources. So, Michael, I have one more question for you and then um, we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, move on to um, a different topic. But, you know, I just wanted to hear from, from your perspective. What do you think are the key considerations for here in the Bay Area for us to move forward with testing out this new concept? Well, I think you're exactly right to call it testing out this new concept. Um, and the the Bay Area is, I think, a classic example where if if you're living there and working there, you really do think of the landscape as certainly more than half developed. Um, and yet, when you start digging into the maps as you get north out of you know you get up into Santa Rosa and Napa, that's not the case at all. So once again, what I'm really talking about is this the scale shift that where we live as humans and have our buildings and our stores and our schools is a surprisingly small amount of the landscape, even in a state like California. And so that's, as you're saying, the, the key concept here is, if you want to think about it, get back and defend where we are, um, rather than trying to solve the problem uh, at a landscape level. And I think the, um, as, as everyone I think here knows, there's, there's a thousand ex exceptions to how this will work. But you're in a position, I think, more than a lot of other places in the country to, to shall we say, kick the tires on this idea a little. You've already got um, extensive uh, folks in the field who are interested in developing these. You've got the, the rudimentary park systems that are kind of on these boundaries. You've got a moment in history where fire demands that we do something about it. And I think it's actually a pretty exciting time. We do as well. Thanks for, for sharing your excitement on, on all of these ideas uh, and, and our next steps that we need to drive together. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring the chat here. I'm seeing there is a lot of interest for this uh, quarter mile buffer uh, community wildfire resilience zone concept. So really excited. Thank you. Well, all let me let me let me answer that question because it is I'm, I'm jumping from a bunch of numbers there. Sure. But so in essence, the, the take home message there was that 20 million acres of California need something done. Um, depending on who you ask, two to five million acres of California are wildland urban interface, which is this place where things come together nearby. So these are maps that show big zones, and that's still quite a bit of land. Now, what we did was literally put the buffers outside of the communities. And so this, this is where it gets tricky. There's are often areas that are under the most pressure for development. Some communities don't want to put a buffer there. They want to put 100,000 more homes. Um, but if we take our current snapshot of the maps of the areas and do those quarter mile buffers, the amazing part is only 110,000 acres of WUI are in those buffer zones for the entire state of California. So if we're just talking quarter mile buffers around places for the entire state, only 110,000 acres also are wildland urban interface. You know, you get to Santa Barbara, a lot of it's the ocean, you know, it's, it's a lot of other things besides WUI. Great. No, thanks for clarifying the numbers there. Uh, absolutely. Um, I also want to shift uh, over to, to Misty and, and possibly Melanie as well for this next question. Also kind of monitoring the chat that there was an earlier question about um, how might this work with agricultural lands and you know what, what could the two of you offer as um, any examples of policy tools or experiences that, that you're seeing um, to really unlock the potential of our working lands 
um, to provide these multiple benefits in addition to you know, wildfire risk reduction? And just any examples you can shed some light on that. I think uh, somebody had a, a curiosity about that. Sure, I, um, I can start, Melanie, and then we can. Um, so we uh, obviously I, there's a lot in the chat about vegetation management, and clearly grazing can be one of the helpful tools. So, um, and Melanie can talk more about that. But one of the things I think is really interesting is that you know our urban communities are developed where food was growing because you know the historical nature of humans was to find where is there water and soil and climates that could you know provide you what you needed to survive. And a lot of our urbanized areas are developed probably where the best soils were at some point, but on these urban fringes, there, there are natural opportunities, at least in our community, and I know it's different everywhere, um, where you can still be growing food on the um, urban edge in areas that are really beneficial for food production due to soils, climate, water availability, those types of factors, natural factors for food production. And what we have found in Sonoma County is that certain types of agricultural crops, particularly permanent crops like vineyard, fire, the fire does not burn in those areas in the same way at all. And as a matter of fact, we saw some areas where the fire completely avoided vineyard and then went in a different route. Um, and it can the same can be said for uh, smaller scale crops where the soil's wetter or it's just a completely different dynamic. And so we are, you know, above and beyond these kind of natural areas where we're managing natural conditions and trying to care carefully for the land and biodiversity. I see that in the chat too, and also offset risk of fire. Um, we're looking at opportunities to continue and, and enhance and increase the amount of food production on these urban edges because it creates direct access to local healthy foods and also helps create a management style that is less impactful for fire. We're, we as an organization are trying to find a balance, right? Not direct the agricultural uses to the most sensitive areas, of course, but find a balance of those things. So wilderness and agriculture. And grazing is, a, is an amazing tool, but I think Melanie can talk about that a little bit more as well. She's uh, got direct experience with grazing on parkland. Yeah, I mean, I, what I like about the question, Sarah, is that, because I was just sitting here thinking, we run the risk, right? of once again, humans oversimplifying, oh, now it's all about fire. And the only reason we need green belts is because of fire. And in, in reality, these green belts, like this is a really important thing that you're underscoring, which is the role that they can play in community wildfire protection and management, but they're gonna continue, they must, they should, continue to um, host, you know, bees and butterflies and provide shade for elders when it's too hot outside. And um, so food and agriculture is part of that. And not every park or open space is appropriate, but many, many, many of them benefit from the right kind, not all kinds, but the right kind of grazing. And so here in Sonoma County, we do have, you know, lamb and wool and um, and, you know, beef and dairy cows and uh, other food producing uh, and fiber producing herds that are part of the intermix uh, that are providing both the stewardship and opportunities for local food producers and local food uh, production and consumption. So that would that should definitely, in my opinion, still be held um, both because of the stewardship and also because of the the role of supporting our um, you know healthy local food opportunities. I just can I just add that um, when you were talking, Melanie, just that you know, our, our focus on climate resiliency often is biodiversity, which is really, really key, uh, but, but we are going to have to feed people as well. And so the transition of climate is, is really going to impact our ability to grow food. And so if we can think about ways that we can have multi-benefits and, you know, have uh, agricultural areas and production where we can minimize fire risk to communities, but also be producing food, I think it's it. Yeah, a community, community gardens even. I mean, we can, there's a lot of different aspects of what we're talking about here that could be part of these resilience buffers. Yeah. Thank you both so much for elaborating on that, that really great question, uh, whoever asked that. And, and I love and just want to elevate up, yeah, what we're kind of talking about here, which is the multiple benefits from green belts. And now we're adding this, this notion of wildfire risk reduction, wildfire resilience. Um, and, and Missy and Melanie both, you know, we were also in, in this effort really seeing that impactful 
practice of regenerative agriculture being you know a model that we could be looking at for these working lands um for in addition reducing emissions you know from from the agricultural production and food production so um love love these examples and, and really uplifting um why we yeah want to continue to see these landscapes um in in in, in multiple ways of benefiting our communities uh and in the face of a changing climate um on this notion of sort of multiple benefits multiple strategies you know we are in wildfire season here. Uh, it's going to take multiple strategies for us to create, you know, truly wildfire resilient communities for us to really get to that point, uh, Tim, that you mentioned earlier of really returning to, to co-live and coexist with wildfire and our landscapes here across the Bay Area and really beyond. And I just want to, you know, acknowledge and, and we, we say this in, in the paper, you know, home hardening and defensible space are, you know, we know essential for wildfire resilience at the individual property level and to more effectively reduce the risk of loss of life and home to wildfires at a broader scale, you know, we need these larger scale solutions that we're talking about here, the role of green belts. And um, so just kind of taking it back to um, how this could be applied and, and impactful and, and elsewhere, you know, beyond the Bay Area. Um, Tim, this is my question for you, you know, from your firefighting experience, um, how is all of this resonating? And, you know, what do you see as important takeaways that uh, we need to hold for relearning to live with wildfire and really advocating for this this power of you know green belts um and the applicability of it to the bay area and beyond yeah well thank you uh, you know we put like all of our chips into wildfire prevention and wildfire suppression and as we know smokey's wrong we you can't prevent all wildfires accidents happen arsonists commit crime power lines fall down, lightning strikes. So we can't prevent all wildfires. And then when wildfires ignite during uh, extreme conditions, firefighters cannot necessarily stop them or put them out. So, uh, but, you know, so we put a lot of burden on the backs of firefighters, but they, we really need a partnership with homeowners and communities. They need to do their share to, you know, help keep people and, and their property safe. So. Uh, just like a chain is only as strong as the weakest link, it just takes one single house not doing its share to put the whole neighborhood at risk. And so it, it's more than just an individual homeowner's or resident's responsibility. It's kind of a community obligation to, to put together, so work collectively to, to address uh, wildfire risks and hazards. And these green belts or wildfire resilience zones around communities is a great model for doing that, you know, collective defense or collective preparation for fire. I think it's a misnomer when people call, say, defensible space is within that home ignition zone of 100 foot outside. You know, no firefighter feels safe with the backs against a wall trying to confront maybe an unstoppable force uh, meeting an unmovable object. That's just uh, not really defensible space. What keeps firefighters safe is their mobility and an ability to stage where they're, uh, you know, where they may be effective. And, it, and I think uh, as Michael pointed out, these, these uh, green belts are places where you can lay out hoses, move engines, uh, light fires, counter fire, in a safe manner that uh, it versus, you know, backs against the wall. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm really, uh, th that's more defensible space for firefighters, mm -hmm. but uh, nothing really affects fire like fire. So we really got to get to that point. I'm, I'm convinced that this is just going to have to become a way of life again, you know, living and working with fire and these green belts are places we can apply fire safer than in our yards <laughs> and, uh, and, and begin to, to, to let fire do its thing on the landscape while knowing that people and property are safe. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, well, we're, we're um, doing a time check here. I know we're almost coming up on the hour. So I'd like to invite uh, Michael, Melanie and Misty to share wow. any, any final thought that you have about um, this opportunity, you know, before us here today, before uh, we we close out the event. 
So I think I said Michael, Melanie, and, and then Misty. I can, I can go. Since Great. I was here to talk about scale, I left one out, which is time. Um, and I see in the comments people talking about the, 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 the kind of shattering damage you see when you drive out to a favorite, favorite hiking area or the woods and they're gone and they're burned, or the kinds of things that change a community when a fire goes through. But as, as Tim mentions a couple times, if you kind of squint and take a longer look at a lot of these things, you know, the, the fires that we're trying to reestablish in the backcountry aren't disasters, they're nature unfolding. I mean, and maybe sometimes hotter than we'd like or that we've seen historically. But I think if we stretch our time view, the kinds of buffer zones I'm proposing, the kinds of green belts you're working for, the kinds of fires back in the backcountry can all start to seem a lot less threatening. Um, and I know there's another huge kink in this, which is smoke. We're going to have a, you know, we're going to be dealing with smoke. But once again, we're, we're dealing with nature as it unfolds. And I think the longer timeline in your brain can really help think about that stuff. Thanks, Michael. Misty or Melanie, any final closing parting words? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I thought we were going like in order. So I was just waiting, watching Melanie, but I can, oh. uh, <laughs> I can hop in. I just, um, I'm just really thankful for this conversation. And one of the things that um, I think I raised with you all, but just for folks who are participating in the attendees today, that, um, you know, obviously there is uh, expertise needed. I saw some, some things being said about, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for a different like amount of types of jobs and expertise. We need more foresters, we need more. Um, but also there are different funding mechanisms that could evolve out of this type of work. And that um, one of the things I was sharing is that FEMA is really comfortable using their hazard mitigation funds that happen after a big major event um, in an area that is designated a federal emergency. They use those funds to in flood prone areas to buy away development rights or um, buy away houses and parcels that have been ruined or flooded time and time again to continue to mitigate for those effects. And that's not something that they've been considering to date for fire. But I do think it's something that we could all be thinking about advocating for is that in these communities we live in where this is gonna be clearly one of the natural events that we're having to um, live with moving forward, uh, effectively buying up some areas that maybe folks don't want to live in anymore. We see that in Sonoma County, little folks are voluntarily choosing not to rebuild. I saw a comment about what if there's already homes there? There might be other tools we're looking at uh, in moving into the future and other opportunities for funding, yeah. I love that thought, Misty. I've heard you say that before and I think that's so right on. We often overlook the land use planning um, aspect of this and, and how we need tools to help us get out of the bad land use planning that we got ourselves into, um, especially in these repeat fire canyons. Um, I think the only thing I was going to offer is Timothy started with a, a, a call out to tribal people and I think um, we are in a position right now in this country where we have a lot of uh, potential to build uh, much more robust partnerships with our tribal partners and they very much are relearning and reteaching their ways not to go back but to go forward through the lens of climate change and through the lens of using active uh, and thoughtful uh, contemplative even management um, to get ourselves sort of unwound of these generations of, of sort of uh, uh, multiple overlapping mistakes we've made. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so I'm hearing, you know, shifting our relationship and our perspective to wildfire, to the smoke that we're going to see and we're going to need to see and prescribed burning, uh, thinking about innovative land use decisions, policies, the tools, maybe these approaches that, that are bold that haven't been done before, transfer development rights or looking at buyouts and what we can learn from other climate uh, hazards that we can apply perhaps to, to the wildfire <laughs> challenges before us um, and really uplifting tribal practices you know our indigenous communities that are have done this are doing these things and and our core partners in, in this work ahead um, so really appreciate thank you each and every one of you for uh, elevating these important concepts and 
you know, for, for Greenbelt Alliance, I just want to say um, thank you so much for being here with us on this very special day as we're sort of launching uh, this work together. Um, you know, we drive our, our local work to really make that on the ground change and conducting this kind of research for us really helps our advocacy be more effective and where we really need to push the envelope. And with this new white paper in hand, we will continue to work hard to protect and steward our natural and working lands around us and, and really look forward to partnering with all of you here on the panel and all of you here today at our event um, so that we can together really figure out how we can implement these recommendations and really deliver that real world change on the ground for us to all coexist with wildfire safely. Um, so with that, you know, I just want to thank everybody for being here and joining us today. If you have questions about the white paper, please send me an email at scardona at greenbelt.org. Um, we will include that here in the chat box as well, so you can get right in touch with us. Um, we'll also send you a direct link to the white paper, which should be up in your uh, chat box in just a moment here. So definitely please uh, go ahead and check that out and share it with your colleagues. Um, and and also follow us on social media to stay uh, more connected with us and in tune with our next steps that we're taking on this work. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention to you is another way for you to see this critical work through to action is by donating to support our work. Uh, and you can do that by uh, visiting greenbelt.org slash donate today. And we so thank you for your support and partnership here. So uh, look forward to working with all of you here today. And just thank you so much and wishing every one of you a good evening. Thanks, everyone.